howdy, 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 and welcome to the Snortcast. My name is Diana Wynn, and I'm your host, and I'm also a snorter. And welcome to the show. And as howdy, you know, howdy, howdy. I would like um, you so it's to been tell me. nine days since what? Feed Me was oh. released. Sorry about that. I've got to have to. <laughs> That's me talking over myself. Um, as you know, if you're watching the show, please tell us where you are watching the show from. I want to know where you are snorting from. And please let us know if you're snorting live or on replay. Um, it's so important for me to know where my audience is watching this show from. So what is the Snortcast? The Snortcast is a live interview show talking to funny people all around the world why funny how they use the comedy in their work and how you can do that too and this is why this show is on linkedin and on facebook because i know many of you are wondering how do these people use their funny and so it's something i've learned in this pandemic that we are missing process in the arts how do you do it so i'm really excited to have my guests come in to talk about how she uses her funny and how she's done it for over 20 years to have a career that's still ongoing and still making people laugh. Before I bring her on, I do want to talk about a charity that I'm supporting this month. It's called September. Uh, you know how I like to dance uh, on LinkedIn and I also believe in movement, that movement brings joy. And I want to support um, this charity, uh, Cerebral Palsy, just so that children who are unable to move are supported with um, these funds. So please go to the link. You can support September, support my profile, and we can uh, raise money and awareness. Okay, so if you are supporting this program, uh, you do know you can support my Patreon. And if you're on all our social medias, you just go to at the Snortcast, uh, hashtag, the Snortcast, and you can follow me there. But remember, tell us where you're watching from, where you're snorting from. I know our community is from all around the world. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to chat in the chat box and we can have a conversation with you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm always, it's, it's always um, a bit of a roll to get through to this part, but I, I'm always love it when I bring on my guest and my guest is Libby Gore. She is a broadcaster and performer with warmth, wit and humour. I've known her work for years and I was re having a, like a memory lane of going, I know Libby but where? And I remember it was from the early 90s, she was on the Denton show um, and she, she's just hilarious and the last couple of three to four months we've been interacting with her radio work and it's been quite a privilege and honour to be part of her world talking about women and our parts. So really grateful that she's come on to the show and the Snortcast today. She's also a writer of two books. It's the A to Z of Mummy Manners, an etiquette guide for managing other children's mothers and assorted mummy dilemmas. Check that out. And also the bedtime poem for edible children, which I want to ask her how she got that title. So without further ado, I want to bring her on and I'm just going to show her a bit of her work so you can see her in action. Here we go. Hello. I can see some of you looking at me and going, oh, my God, I recognise her. <laughs> it's Effie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're much too fun. See, this girl just said, no, I, I thought you were Miranda Kerr. <laughs> As an Australian icon, I have always aspired to be an Arnott's Biscuit. Because I honestly believe that Monte Carlos are Australia's favourite biscuit. Don't you agree? Yeah. They are Australia's, and you know why? Because the Monte Carlo, just by its name, says everything about Australia that we want our country to be. Because when I say Monte Carlo, as an Australian, I think sexy, glamorous, and tax-free. And that is the Australia I want to live in, people. I mean, let's face it, you don't hear of anybody eating a biscuit called the Canberra, <laughs> do you? No? 
And this is why welcoming Libby Gore. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm still trying to. I'm still trying to. Um, you know, do all those technological things, but everything's going fine. How are you? Everything good? You've just caught me cutting and pasting. <laughs> Oh, oh, I need you to help me. <laughs> um, Libby, thanks for joining the show, The Snortcast, on this night to talk about comedy and why you do comedy. But yes. before we do that, who are you? What are you talking about? Who am I? Who are you? Well, I am a, um, if I was an onion, how would I do it first? I would say first and foremost. I'm a mother and I'm a woman and I'm a creative. Oh, I forgot to say I'm a partner. I'm in there as well. Uh, that is just as valuable. Uh, maybe, yeah, no, it's valuable as well. All of those things and I'm a creative and that's and that's who I am. I don't quite know how to answer that question. Who am I? I guess I'm probably Sybil because I've got a number of voices going on in my head at any <laughs> one time. Why, who do you think I am? What were you saying about me behind my back? Who am I? What do you think? Yeah, I, I, I get that feeling too. Know that feeling? I know that feeling of different voices in your brain. And I just think, sorry? No, no, I'm I'm with you all. I'm with you. <laughs> um and I want to acknowledge I want to acknowledge the guests that are watching the show. Thank you for joining the show. We've got the USA, we've got Pakistan, Bangladesh, Iran, we've got Brian from Ohio. He's always watching um the show. Thank you so much for joining the show. Uh, the show is the Snortcast, and we've got Libby Gore talking about comedy. Libby, yes. what what um, what is your first memory of comedy in your life that you remember? Oh God! <laughs> <sighs> look, probably something that is a oh God. look. I have two older brothers, mm. so I was the youngest, and my family was a funny family, but you have to remember I'm a bit older than you and I grew up in the 70s. That was my childhood. That was my childhood. And so the things that made us laugh were world championship wrestling. Have you heard of that? It's yes. like this iconic thing that used to happen in Melbourne in the in the 70s. It was like, yeah, except, except wogs in those days or you Australians in those days didn't have names like, Nguyen or or um, Singh, it was Mario Milano and, you know, it was Italians and Greeks, Spiros the Greek, and, you know, my background was Jewish, so, like, I was different as well. Like, I was, um, I went to an Anglican girls' school and, uh, and they used to say, go up and down on the left-hand side of the stairs, girls, go up and down on the left-hand side of the stairs. It was very strict. And it was just me and the American exchange students that couldn't get that right. Like they'd never heard of Jews at, in Glen Iris, which was very white skinned and leafy. So I learned to develop a sense of humor very, very early because I had these two older brothers. I didn't fit in at school because I, well, apart from being a wog in an Anglican school, something else was really wrong with me in that my mother actually worked, you know, and the other mother picked their kids up in Citroens and played tennis. So um, I had to laugh because otherwise I would not have survived that childhood, I would imagine. And my brothers used to sit on me and tickle me and lick my face until I wet my pants, you know, just normal stuff. <laughs> to laugh. And we watched Really unsound things on the television, Diana. Like I'm ashamed to say that I grew up on a diet of Benny Hill. Benny Hill. We loved Benny Hill. There no. was a man called Rubber who, you know, like it was just madness. And Dave Allen, who was this Irish comedian that mum and dad used to watch, he used to sit on a stool and drink from a whiskey glass and he had a like one finger missing. So it was all of that, you know. Wow. Staying up to date with you folks. I need to do some Googling of Benny Hill later. <laughs> you not, do you not know Benny Hill? No. Oh, gosh, he was this English comedian. Magda does an amazing version of him now. Okay. But he was this very large English comedian who did a lot of sexy girls with big tits comedy. 
and you used to chase them and there was always a chase sequence at the end whereby da 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 dun dun da 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 dun da 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 dun dun and everyone would run and chase girls with big boobs and it was very 70s. Paul Hogan, very ochre Australian. Okay. You know, it was just so different to what we are now. Yeah. Or no, I, I have got it. <laughs> But cut a long story short, I felt strange enough my name being Libby. Like I just wanted it to be Debbie like everybody else. Oh, no, you don't. No. I, I don't. There's, a, there's a famous video and it's not. <laughs> I think yeah. it was Debbie. It wasn't Debbie Does Dallas, was it? It was Libby Does Law School in my day, but anyway. There you go. <laughs> who, who inspires your comedy? So you talked about, what was it, Benny? Hill. No, he didn't inspire my comedy. It was just like that's how I was exposed to it. Ah, oh, gotcha. And exposed. Anyway, you look up Benny Hill. All right. Well. Um, uh, yeah, what was your question? Who exposed me to comedy? Who inspires your comedy? Like from the now. 90s, yeah, to, to now. Like who gets you to be funny still? I don't think... I don't think I've ever really looked at it, apart from when I was in the Hot Bagels, which was my my first professional, like, comedy gig. I just know that I was good at making people laugh. So I was good at making people laugh at school. And, you know, when you're different, you find your way of winning, don't you? And so the, at, um, I ended up at MLC in Melbourne and it was an amazing school because it had everything you know you could find your tribe there it was big enough to find your tribe and there was a music competition and the girls did floaty songs like white a shade of pale and this that and the other and there was an amazing music teacher called Jane Elton Brown who let me rewrite all the school songs into um sort of naughty when I say naughty I don't mean saucy I just mean recalcitrant satiric ditties about being a teenager. It was in the time of puberty blues and I called ours puberty greens because MLC was silver and green. And she stitched together all of these school songs into a, a mini opera and she had the school pianist play them and uh, and no one had ever done anything like that before and, of course, it brought the house down and, and that showed me that being original and having people who backed you with original thought and slight being slightly provocative yes. could work could Thank could work you. for you there were some people who actually celebrated mm -hmm. not so much an anti-authoritarian attitude but who celebrated a bit of spunk so i would have to say that that my secondary school mlc really supported me and that they yeah. had kate Bridget there but she was a little bit older than me no i can hear it because you have spunk you're always on the edge i love it you're you're yeah, if you had a cabaret, I would come and watch it. <laughs> I used to have a cabaret, and I'm not nearly as much on the edge as I used to be. Like, Ooh. people who are older than you, they would tell you that I well, I was much more, I'm very mellow now. Like, <laughs> now. Love it. Sort of pat me, you know. Uh, yeah. I used to be much and, wilder. You know, you Really? Um, <laughs> Should we go into it? <laughs> I didn't hear that. Question. What? I'm saying we shouldn't. We, should, we, we, we don't have to go too deep into how wild you were. Oh, no, it was just wild on television because I had license and I had cameras and I had, you know, an opportunity. Elle McFeast, which was my uh tv incarnation which was a send-up of Elle mcpherson really uh not being tall and slim and beautiful and therefore denied access to power through having a powerful boyfriend because who would want you for fuck's sake when oh beg your pardon who would want you when you have you know thighs and um so there was that whole Elle mcfeast incarnation and it's funny because i see um i see others doing that now and I think that whole body image with girls is still just such a an overwhelming shadow and it's a really good one to push against. However, I'm not into self-hatred as comedy. I don't sort of... Mm -hmm. Celeste Barber does it in a really good way now. Like I once posed 
with sausages around my neck because Elle McPherson did a, a shower shoot with um, shells around her neck but just covered her nipples. Yeah. And I sat up on Live and Sweaty with a thing of sausages and sort of rubbed it. And um, anyway, <laughs> it wasn't long before I was hosting that show. But mm. I meant it. Like I meant it because I just didn't feel like there was access for girls unless you were skinny and pretty and Anglo-Saxon. So that was just my way of rebelling. And, you know, that that character came out from Andrew Denton's show and then you did a two-year spin-off of it. Is that correct? Uh, that character actually didn't come out of, it was in Denton's show, but it came out of a Melbourne radio show called Kick to Kick. Ah, oh, okay. It was a radio character and oh. it was made up to go with Grubby, Peter Stubbs, that's Richard Stubbs' brother. Yes. And Trevor Marmalade, who came out of Punter to Punter, which was a racing send-up, they made up Kick to Kick, which was a footy send-up, and I um, met them through the Hot Bagels, which was my all-girl cabaret group, which was inspired by Bette Midler and the like. Yeah, that but... sort of Jewish uh, four-girl <laughs> comedy thing was really fun. I joined that. That wasn't my group. It was the Fishman Sisters, and they put me in. Oh. And yeah, and that, and, I, and that's how I met that crowd through um, the comedy festival because it was like I, I'm almost embarrassed to say, Dana, that I was the first comedy festival, like as a youngster, like 22 or something, and we yeah. supported Dilla, the bagels. And so I met all those guys. Richard Stubbs was the king of comedy. He was on 3XY and his brother, Grubby, used to do a football segment and I joined in with him and Trevor Marmalade and made up Elle McFeast because they all had a, made up names, Grubby and Trevor Marmalade, so I made up Elle McFeast. And I did yeah. it every second Saturday for 20 bucks. Oh. <laughs> like they didn't. And they let me, you know, like they were great. And the coach, Rick Wall, they let me in. They let me yeah. in. Wow. And, you know, and I borrowed the tape recorder from the ABC because I'd done work experience at the ABC. So Tim Lane, whose daughter is Sam Lane, he used to lend me the tape recorder to go and do the interviews for 3X Why? Wow. I don't know, yeah. but I had guts. That's all. I I was like, yeah, I was like you in a way. <laughs> like, you have to make your own path. Mm. How right? how is it for you to sustain that to keep creating your own path? Is that tiring for you, or you've just well, gone? This is my life. I've got to do it. Well, that's it. It is because mm. mm. there is no. Um, there is no career plan when you're at the forefront. And there's a bunch of us that have had to make our own way. There are a number of people who can follow and can go, oh, okay, well, if you start off like that, then you get yourself a radio breakfast gig and then from there you go to TV and then from there you do books and you do a stand-up tour. Like there are well-trodden paths now. Mm. But when you're at the start of that push, um, you just kind of make it up as you go along and make some mistakes and try and figure out how you have a life along with it. Like, as I said, I've got a, a long-term partner. I have two children and and I have parents and I have friends and that is not conducive to being a famous, self-centred, narcissistic person. You know, you, you have to actually um, give of yourself in order to be genuinely contented in life mm. and famous the answer even though that's what they told us when we were growing up with that Irene Cara song you know and, and young talent time and all those other things that you're too young to remember but in my generation we grew up with fame being the answer whether it be places or young talent time or and and yeah I yeah, well, it's similar to now because social media now, like it's the numbers game, like how many followers you have and how many likes you get. That's, I guess that's probably the version of Young Talent. I remember what, I remember Tina Arena was on that show. So I do, you know, there's a calibre of people that I do remember. But, yeah, it's... Um, uh, no, well, Jenny I... Minogue. Yes. Tina Arena. Yes. Um, there was a woman, the first one was um, Debbie Byrne who, who was... Um, Queen of Pop, but it's an awful, it, it, the balance between great fame and contentment for a woman is very hard. I remember some of my female colleagues saying, no, there were no male groupies lining up for them after they'd done a round of stand-up like there would be, say, for the boys 
yes. at a pub. And sometimes the boys wouldn't even talk to them. Mm. Yeah. The boys, I mean the other comics. Yeah. That was in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Well, let's, let's talk about diversity and gender. Um, being a woman in comedy in the 90s to now, have you seen there's been a change or there's more that we, we need to do as a, as a sector of, you know, male, female comedians? I think there are lots of girl comedians, female women comedians doing their own thing now and, and not having to, you know, having relatively safe, safer paths, I think. Yes. So for me, making up Elle McFeast on the radio, they made up a show for Andrew Denton in Sydney, that Sydney comedy department, because he was doing blah, blah, blah at the time, which was a, um, you know, it rated ones and twos and all the hip people watched it and it was sort of um, social issue based. I think Julia Zamiro might have been in it and I think Jean might have been in it too, Jean Kitson. It was all around the time of the big gig, which was 1986. So there was this big comedy scene happening in Melbourne, in Melbourne in particular, around about 1986, 1987, which is what brought on the comedy festival. And so many of us that you see now who are in our 50s came out of that. But there was wow. a in front of us. So there's, you know, me, Magda and I were at uni together with all the DGen, which are the working dog. You know, like we were all at Melbourne Uni together. Wow. Within, within a three or four year age range yes. and we did law reviews and things but before us and Mick Malloy was there and um, Jane Kennedy obviously, Jane Turner, Gina wasn't there, she was at St Martin's but they met at Fast Forward through Steve Vizard. You know, like there's this whole family tree of of people and before them the Melbourne crowd was Barry Humphreys, Rod Pontock, whatever, they all did the Archie review. Anyway, I know that all sounds very elite. But in Melbourne, they did the big gig and fast mm. forward. Sydney, they had death and they made up a sports show for HG and Roy and HG and Roy pulled out at the last minute. They were on blah, 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 and they made them up a sports show. They pulled out at the last minute and so they gave it to Andrew and then they needed a Melbourne correspondent and Rachel Berger said to Ted Robinson, that Libby's doing El McFeast on the radio and that's how I got in. So that is not answering your question, but that's the long convoluted story of hand passes and dribbles and one percenters that ended me up being here with you 30 years later. Wow. Yeah. What was the question? Amazing. <laughs> no, just... This must be that buffering thing that oh. happens. Are you... you might have to send me a um, it's just... <laughs> it's just you might have to hear about the birthing of comedy in Melbourne. What did Jackie, you say? I'm just it's so great to hear you talk about the birth of comedy in Melbourne. That's 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 so wonderful. Well it was pretty Melbourne was yeah. pretty amazing for that. And it all came out of the Prince Patrick Hotel, which is in Victoria Street. I mean, just wave at me when you want to stop because the line's a bit wonky, but, um, like, the Doug Anthony All-Stars would play there, the Cabbage Brothers who are no longer around, but they were fantastic. It was that We were that musical comedy strain. There was uh, Simon mm. Palomares and George Caponieris, who were the Tibaldi brothers, and they ended up being wogs out of work with Nick Giannopoulos. There was just so much happening. Wow. And a lot of the comedy was about fitting in. So whether you were arty or too geeky smart or um, insecure-looking girls, which was the bagels, or woggy like the, the Tibaldis, it, it was really quite a scene. It was really quite a scene. Wow. Love it. It was really fun. You would have loved it. Such a good time. It. it was so much fun. Even my oh. mother, who was like straight as straight, used to ring the Prince Patrick if she didn't know where I was just to check and see if I was there. You know, like it was it, it was quite a scene, the Prince Patrick Hotel. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you for so much sharing such a, a history and, you know, memory lane to just, just even feel it. I feel that energy. That's where, that's where comedy really picked up in Melbourne. 
Um, with comedy in Melbourne at the moment, you know that um, we're in a pandemic, COVID's hit us. How have you been going on and how have you had to see lightness during this time? Well, I see myself as fortunate because I have I have a family who have been well schooled and a good loving partner who's helped look after me and and I have a job. Mm. So whilst all my events and things, just like you and everybody else, all of that live stuff has fallen off. Mm. Yeah, very scary and sad. But I because I work at the ABC as the Duchess of Weekends. I still have an income and I'm incredibly grateful and I'm very privileged. But in that position, I have also been um, privy to distress, people's distress, because, because you're you're the ringmaster of people's emotions in there and, and you're the conduit. We're there to connect people when they can't go out and I've never felt that responsibility more heavily. Am I always funny about it? No, but I always think that humour is, is one of the greatest tools in resilience. So I've seen my job as to help steel people towards coping with warmth and humour, basically. It's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I well, love it. What do you do? What do yeah. you do, Diana? I mean, there are some things you just have to submit to, you know, grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change. And there are some things like restrictions that you just have to submit to for the greater good that's the way i see it you know we're part of a community that's why we've got compulsory voting because it's embedded in our legislation that we all have a civic duty and even if you go into vote and you just draw a picture at least you go into vote so um i see that the same way that's what's different between us and america mm. they don't have to they don't have to vote they don't have to but we do we have to at least turn up yeah. even if we just draw a penis or <laughs> and let's talk to, about turning up to your ABC radio show on the weekend. Yes. Um, do you? Uh, how does it feel like to have a job and to do it to have a job that you love? Lucky. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very lucky. How long have you been working for ABC Radio Melbourne for? Uh, we returned to Melbourne in 2012, and I presented the Sunday show for a few years and then last year took over the whole weekend. So it's been in two steps. So I guess it's eight years I've been back in Melbourne working wow. now. Fantastic. And, you know, we did a show last week and thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk about what it is to be a woman and a woman parts. What's that fire in you? Because you do... in how we flow as women. What's the interest in that? Why well, is it? I'm interested in lots of things. It's just that I'm not scared of stuff, mm. I think. And that exercise, our Women's Health Project, was a partnership with, <clears throat> with Jean Hales for Women's Health, which is a big women's health pro bono organisation here in Melbourne and the Queen Victoria Women's Centre, which is another big women's mental health organisation here in Victoria. <coughs> and the way we got it up was to help support Jean Hale's Women's Health Week. And one of the things that women don't talk about, which I've noticed from my Sunday show, which is of health and wellness for the flawed and optimistic, yes. some women feel like they're true sexuality is ignored. So if they're over 50 and they're menopausal, they don't exist. Um, if they're not Instagrammable, they don't exist. And uh, so the show that we did that you were part of in terms of the private parts was looking at a way of, of integrating a healthy body image and sexual identity into mental health mm -hmm. and and it was, it was interesting, you know, because it wasn't about how often you have sex or how long you have sex or this or that. Or that. It, wasn't, it wasn't that linear. It was honestly about all those private thoughts you have about, uh, am I okay? Is this mm. what I want? Is this, am I fulfilled? Is, am I content? Is this me? And, 
you know, I always think that humour is a great way to disarm people. So mm -hmm. we have laughs. But when the conversation moves towards women who have had mastectomies trying to rediscover their or feel good about their bodies and reintegrate into having a sexual relationship or what do you do with a guy if he's if he's had in issues with his prostate and can't get an erection and how do you reignite passion within a relationship or do you actually need to have sex to have a good relationship or is there anything wrong with being on your you know all of those niggly deep dark thoughts that can cause mental health issues yes we we'll just sort of address mm. but after we've had a laugh and the laugh is like the schnitzel bit where you pummel it yes you know it allows you to open up that's why i love humor so much mm. i always call it mary poppins you know it's that spoonful of sugar that helps make the hard stuff more palatable yeah beautiful and um our audience are watching in right now where, I can't see them. where are they this is in one's head no nothing wrong at all i have many chats with the voices in my head phil all the time shut up no, you shut up no uh, um, and we've also had someone say, resilient people generally have an amazing sense of humour through and through. Well done, ladies. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, it's true, though. No, it's true. That's why the Jews, you know, have got such a dark sense of humour. But you'll find that so many of the comics who have got a Jewish background aren't afraid to go dark because mm -hmm. out of that depths of despair, if you can find something to laugh about, you'll get to tomorrow in a better state. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I I go I do go dark in my comedy, and sometimes I don't know how to pull out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a hard thing. It's so. What do you do? Like, how do? Is there anything that I'm saying that resonates with you with what you do? Like, I've often found that girls use their comedy to work out their issues. So I've seen even recently that I'm so fat, or I'm so ugly, or I don't fit in because I'm a particular race. You know, I've seen a lot of that self-hating stuff. Then Hannah Gadsby said, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. But so much of that confessional comedy is about what you're uncomfortable. And then for your second set, you've got to think of something else. Yes. So bring it. So you don't know this about me, but um, and my audience on LinkedIn, they know a bit about but let's talk about it. Um, yeah. My email got hacked uh, five years ago and someone downloaded all my naked photos. Why did um, you have naked photos? Sorry? Why did you have naked photos? I was in a long t I was in a long term relationship internationally and back then there wasn't WhatsApp. There right. wasn't yes. So someone yeah. hacked into it and I didn't know how to talk about it, so I talked about it in my comedy show and wrote a song and just had a great laugh about it and it was therapy for me and my audience didn't know that I was Whether gonna go there. Yeah, but they went with me and um, they hugged me with their laughter. So that was that was the therapy I needed. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. And you know, it's my body. I've 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 gone. Who cares? It's my boobs. It's whatever. Um, yeah. So it was really my way just to go. It's out there. There's nothing I can do. Move on. Um, and I wanted to celebrate it. I wanted to celebrate that my body was on the internet. <laughs> You and Kim Kardashian. <laughs> I just didn't make enough money, that's all. <laughs> I I know. Know. Well, you didn't go far enough. There should have been more than photos. You should have made them move. Uh, yes. <laughs> if your mother had been any good, she would have managed it better. She would have. Yeah. You know, she would have. <laughs> <laughs> she just doesn't know. Um, we've got one of your fans saying, "Put Desi, Desi from." Hello, Desi. Desi. Now, Desi's <laughs> one of my producers at ABC Radio Melbourne, and she is divine you need a good producer you need someone who loves you and wants you to be great i agree i've got a producer and she's great uh shout out to serena hunt <laughs> love your work um before we go to the q a i do yeah. want to ask you this question which is a lot of people here on linkedin want to use comedy in their presentation oh yeah What's your tip to for someone to use comedy in their presentation or storytelling I will try and answer the question without rambling because <laughs> you sort of pressed my storytelling button. Um, well, I like telling my stories because not many people ask for them, but, I, you know, they were golden and so that's why I tell them. 
Mm. Uh, so my tips are, number one, open with a joke. It's always good to open with a joke. And probably your second best one. But the joke needs to be authentic to the room. So you do need to read the room. You need to know who you're speaking with. So if you're speaking to a group of, I don't know, accountants, if everybody knows the same thing, you know, if there's a common a common well of knowledge that that you're all privy to, well, then a joke about that will probably set you off on a good on a good note. So, for instance, just say there's a big boss manager and everybody knows that he hates the colour or she hates the colour green. Mm. So if you were to stand up at the podium after you were introduced, say, and you said, um, I wanted to uh, get off on the right foot, as you can see, I'm not wearing green, then everyone would kind of know what you were talking about. It's that 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 link yourself in with people. That's what it is. You know, I'm on this. This is the way I do it. I mean, I've actually had some terrible gigs, Diana. Mostly of them have been to accountants. <laughs> Um, when I say mostly, there have been maybe three in my life that have been shocking corporate gigs and that's because I've had nothing in common with them. Mm. You know, gender, subject matter, all of it is combined to make it a complete mismatch. Yeah. But there has to be something that you can say about that room and that group that says I'm one of you. That's what I think. And I also think that being self-deprecating, although the other thing, you, you know, what do they say, punching up? Like don't punch down, don't pick on people, mm. punch up. Like you can prick power and authority but don't hurt the little one. Yes. Um, but the best humour for me, because I'm not a great joke writer, I'm not like, um, I'm not like, um, you know, like that Steve Wright kind of thing who can make up non sequiturs that are just funny. Some people are just good at that. I'm just trying to think of the Australian equivalent of that but I can't. But generally, humour comes out of, for me, painful truths. So I've always found that the best humour comes out of painful truths and that might just be because I'm sharp. Other people can make more gentle things, but but it does come out of truth. And, and people say, oh, many a true word is spoken in jest. That is true. But if you're authentic, I think people are more into uh, stuff that's of your heart that's funny than any kind of made-up. What do you think, Desi? Do you agree with me? <laughs> I, do. I really do think that's the way it's gone. I really yeah. do think that's the way it's gone. Well, yeah, my my storytelling is uh, non-fictional, but then, you know, you, you add a little kicker in amongst the story where you might. Well, just start feel... true. I yes. mean, if you were to do a stand-up set, it would start true and you'd twist it. Yeah, kick so, it around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Got to twist it a bit. Yeah. Um, but I... but... I thought you meant if you were to give an address at work or something. But if you want to be a stand-up comic, oi. No. No, no. That's that's another that's another that's another tip. No, you were right. You were on the right path before. Do you think people still want to be stand-up comics? That's a good question. Does anyone here want to be a stand-up comic? <laughs> Is this a tip? I've never really done it. Um I mean, I do it in spurts. I do it for a reason. If I'm invited to do a charity thing or whatever, I'll do mm. a round. I call it sticky floor stand up and book myself in at pubs where my foot feet stick to the floor. Yes. I get myself match fit. <laughs> for it. And, and 21. It, <laughs> they gave me 20 bucks. So the last time I did it, at the end of last year, they gave me 20 bucks and I stuck it, I stuck it to the wall because it was just so... Sweet. Oh, no, it was sweet. Love it. I've been given 20 bucks for a gig before. It was good. <laughs> um, we've got a question from our audience. Um, they said, Whoa, entertainment is a crazy industry. How do you guys maintain your focus and endless energy building your personal brand of the years and across the all different forms of media? What a great long question. Well, that's more for you than me because I need your help to do that for me now. Okay. Well, personal branding, yes, but you have had a career in in this industry for over twenty years. How have you maintained your focus and endless energy, Libby? What is that focus? I don't know whether I've been focused. I've just been determined, 
and I've done a good job. Mm. I've done my job. Yeah. Bam. Love it. You've just got yeah. to do your job and you've got to just keep loving it and doing your job as best you can do your job and try and have people who work with you enjoy being around you doing your job and appreciate the fact that you might think differently. Um, mm. But bottom line is you've got to do your job. And if you're a comedian, your job is to make people laugh. I, I'm a, I've had too much going on in my personal life to have that discipline of being a comic, full stop, and mm. I've enjoyed being more Oprah on crack. Like a, have enjoyed being a radio personality with a sense of humour. <laughs> well, I have. I have. I've enjoyed that. And I'm, yeah. You've got crazy. it. Huh? Why? What's wrong with that? It's what it is. Yeah, you have to have that on your bio. Oprah. Please, can you just have that in your bio? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Oprah. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes I wish I was paid like an FM radio personality, but that's passed me by. Like, that's not going to happen for me now. And possibly because I am, I also have this this training whereby I, I, I'm curious and I crave knowledge and you know when I was McFeast the joke came first mm. and the intellect or the insight was second and now it's the other way around mm. yeah so I, I like the insight into the human condition I do like mm. that it keeps me happier I, I, I'm in that same space as you I'm, I'm hearing mm-hmm. that the intellect yeah um, another question we've got is from Sophie. How do you build a strong sense of confidence in your work? I want to know how you get these things up here. How do you manage this? How do you do this? You're so clever. And you do it? <laughs> um, see, we always needed permission to broadcast, but you're just doing it. I just so admire you. Um, how do you bring a strong sense of confidence? Well, when you get a laugh or you get another job, the problem with what we do, Sophie, is that a lot of your confidence is predicated on the approval of other people. Mm. And that's not particularly healthy. But um, if you can do some good works as well and get laughs and, and help people at the same time, whether it be a charity for bushfires or mothers at schools. I, I used to get a lot of pleasure going around to primary schools and doing my therapy comedy about being a mother for other mothers and um, and the gig, no charge for the gig. It just was my community service in a way that helped me and helped them raise money for the school and also it was a friendly audience because, let's face it, guys in pubs aren't going to want to hear about women in lycra who don't go to the gym waiting at the school gate, you know, like it was to a particular niche audience. Yeah. Um, that gives you a sense of gratitude that you've done something good. But if you're going to rely on, uh, you know, getting a Logie or a um, mention on some, you know, you, name checked by someone else famous or Insta follower or whatever, yeah. then you're going to be precarious. You're going to be a new age Judy Garland and and the problem with our business is it's precarious anyway. You just don't know from one year to the next whether something's going to continue. So you have to have a strong sense of self-worth from the inside. And that does not come from fame. That comes from doing a good job when you do it and, and having good people around, real people around you that want to be around you, not because of anything else than, you know, you either gave birth to them or you sleep with them or something or they, you know, or they gave birth to you. But you know what I mean? Like it needs to be founded in reality. Yes. No, that's truth. That's some truth bombs there. Thank you. And we've got got this question, which I think goes back to the mission. Um, uh, Mohit asks, how how to find purpose in life? How to, I don't know if that's a question. How do you find purpose in life? Yeah, how do you find purpose in life? Well, how have you, Libby? Family? Or yeah. um, don't know. <laughs> no, don't know. You just take. Um, sounds a bit wanky, but I've learned in middle age, and I am smack bang in middle age now, to uh, 
take my joys where I can find them and generally they're in smaller things mm. and realising that you're not as important as you thought you were. So in my 30s when I was very, very famous, when I was Elle McFeast, I thought I was very important and, I, and they told me I was important. The people I worked with told me I was important. Mm. And I realised part of that time, part of that was also to keep me compliant in a way and dependent upon ju their judgement. Um, and I'm grateful for that. I will ever be grateful for the decade or so that I was Elle McFeast and had the privilege of the airwaves at the ABC. Mm. And now when I'm told no to a myriad of what I still think are great ideas and innovative ideas, I don't take it as an indication of the worth of those ideas or my worth. I just think, well, I, I've got to do it a, a different way. So how do you find your purpose? I don't actually know, but you do need a passion project and you do need three things. You need choices. You need good, strong relationships. And you need... So you need choices, good, strong. Well, choices means financial choices as well. So you need to be able to support yourself because that leads to choice, good, mm. strong relationships and a sense of meaning. Mm. And I don't know where, and that is something you have to find for yourself. It could be through a hobby. It could be through a fam family. It could be through a passion project. But those three things add up to contentment. And then Julia Baird would say that you need to give yourself a dose every day of awe and wonder and not just walk past the sunset and say isn't that nice but to actually set the alarm for 6 38 or whatever time it says the sunset sunrise is going to be and get up and go and look at it and feel small and insignificant and know you don't matter and that when you die stiff shit you know life will go on and when you have a sense of that then you can do something with what you've got today does that make sense Oh, so, so much sense. That is so beautiful. I, oh. need to take one pill. I could take one of my cat's Prozac. That would be good. <laughs> um, but it's so true, you know, Anna. It's true. Like small pleasures and nature, realising there are big trees out there and you're nothing. Mm. Sophie says thank you for, for your tips and wisdom. And Chris on Facebook just said, remember chatting with Libby in the car park of a building in Crow's Nest, Sydney? <laughs> I remember that. Oh, no, but I know that. I know the car park and I know the building in Crow's Nest City and it was the worst year of my life. It was 1998, wasn't it, Chris? <laughs> Terrible. Professionally, worst year of my life. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Did, I tell you that, Chris? Did I tell you how bad it was? Did I? Did I? Tell me. No. We'll find out. And before we leave, what's what's next on your journey? Are you got, do you have a passion project that you're working on? I do. I have a passion project that I'm working on. It's harder than I thought. Um, but, uh, but one of my colleagues showed me a book that she just had published. I was with her when she was sort of scratching out the last bit of it, you know, to get to the finishing line and I was encouraging her and she showed it to me today and I thought, I have to finish. I have to finish. I've got to keep giving myself options. So as long as you've got options, you can cope with the precariousness of today, I think. Mm. And I might have some ice cream. <laughs> what about you? Well, I've got Belgium chocolate in my fridge. Oh, I would like some Belgium chocolate. That would be delicious. Has it all been too heavy or is it okay what we've done? Is it all right? Do you mind? Yeah, yeah it's fine. Why are you asking me this? This has been great. Thank you. It's interesting, isn't it? Like, who knows where it's all going to take us, but you just got to do your job, Diana. Yeah, <laughs> this is what I'm doing and thank you so much for being my guest tonight um, to share your wisdom. It's uh, so beautiful to hear your stories. Like, I'll take yeah. you to the Prince Patrick when we're allowed to go out again. I'll take you to the Prince Patrick. If you will listen to my stories, I will tell you my stories. They'll go on and on and on and I'll show you where I did this and where we did that and when Paul McDermott did this and how the Doug Anthony's did that and how I chased Richard Stubbs here and, you know, like it goes on and on, but, geez, it was fun. Oh, God, I love it. Yeah, it was Listen. really good fun. <laughs> no, I love it. No, we'll, we'll have a date and we'll have a drink and dance on the middle of Flinders Street because I love that picture of you dancing on Flinders Street. 
I love that picture of you dancing. Nadia, my producer Nadia and I got up very early and took that photo. Imagine that, no one there. Locked down, <laughs> Melbourne, mask. Down. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. That's it. That's the end of the show. Oh, what a shame. I could have talked all night, but then you know that, don't you? Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining and thanks to everyone for joining the show. We'll see you all next week. And before we leave, I'm uh, just going to end with this video and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.